Hello, church family. Hope that you are doing well. Thanks for joining me for this devotional. When do we get to the good stuff? When do we get to the good stuff? One passage that we know in the churches of Christ that you, as uh, someone who studied your Bible, know very well is Acts chapter 2. I want to read a few verses from Acts chapter 2, a good portion of the verses. Probably uh, about the only part that I won't read is Peter's actual sermon, but I want us to set the setting, uh, set the stage, and then ask us the question, when do we get to the good stuff? Let's start in Acts chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 1. You'll remember, of course, in chapter 1 uh, that Jesus has just ascended, uh, that they were staring up, looking into the sky after Jesus. The angel showed up and said, what are you looking at? Uh, go back and God will give you what he's promised. And then in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were filled, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit had given them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when all this sound occurred, the crowd came together and went and were bewildered, because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They, they were amazed and astonished, saying, Why, are, are not all these speaking Galileans? And how is it that we are each hear them in our own language, to which we were born? The Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they were continued, they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? So here we have uh, the Holy Spirit for the first time coming upon uh, the apostles and the disciples who are gathered there in that room and uh, the tongues of fire appear and, and they're able to speak in different languages all of a sudden miraculously without any uh, training. Uh, and this is what speaking in tongues is, the ability to speak different languages because we have all these people from every nation under the, under the, under the, under the sky, right? And all of these different ones that were just mentioned and they speak different languages and, and, uh, and he says, we all hear in the language to which we were born. And this is, they, they were amazed and perplexed. What does this mean? And of course, after that, uh, someone claims that they must be drunk. And that's when Peter stands up and uh, speaks up above the rest of the crowd, I suppose, and, and speaks to everyone. And again, everyone is hearing Peter in their own language amazingly. Uh, something that was, is even hard for us to fully grasp and, and wrap our minds around. But he is speaking in all these different people. They hear him. Uh, they understand him, and he teaches them about Jesus. Let's pick up in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, the crowd, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what can we do? Peter said to them, Repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that, they, that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So here the, the gospel message, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because of our sin is preached. The people respond to it. What can we do? And Peter answers them the same way that I would answer someone today. What can I do about sin in my life? Repent of that sin and be baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we see there that he continues on. And he says, be saved from this perverse generation, from this perverse world that we live in. We need salvation from this world that we live in. And Christ offers that salvation. And on that day, amazingly, I, I cannot imagine 3,000 people were baptized. 
and became Christians. How amazing is that? But, you know, the, the amazing part of the story of Christianity doesn't start there, stop there. It goes in verse 42 through 47. Notice what the, these early Christians do. They, those who had responded, those who had become Christians, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their, their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. We look at this. We look at the church as it begins in Acts chapter 2. And that is the standard, isn't it? We in, in the churches of Christ uh, have what you know have this restoration call. We don't want to be like the church of the 20th century, the 18th century, the 17th century, the 16th century, the 31st century. We want to be like the church of the first century. We want to be like the church that Jesus died to establish that we read of in the book of Acts and that we read of different congregations throughout the rest of the New Testament. That's what we want to be like. That's what we want to, to think like, to study like, to preach like, to teach like, to live like 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 this in Acts chapter 2 verses 42 through 47. I just started uh, reading a book and uh, I want to share something with you. The book is called uh, New Day and it's by David Young and he is a, a member of the church and uh, he, he tells a story about when he had just graduated from Freed Hardeman University and got a job in Mississippi uh, in 1983. Uh, and he was there at a fairly small congregation of somewhere around 60 or 70 members. Uh, and most of them were all from, you know, Mississippi or the specific place he lived in in Mississippi was very close to Arkansas. So there was a lot of, a lot of farming, a lot of farmers, a lot of uh, country folks. Uh, but there was one man, uh, I believe his name was Frank, uh, and he was from New Jersey. Uh, so he was a little bit different. Uh, he, he didn't quite fit in. But he had become a Christian shortly before uh, Mr. David had, had arrived there to, to be the, uh, the minister at the congregation there. Uh, and, and he, once, he had, once uh, David had arrived, David, uh, the preacher there, challenged the congregation to read through the book of Acts. And of course, you're going to run into Acts chapter 2 pretty quickly as you're reading through the book of Acts. Uh, and, and he had this, this interaction. And one day when he's sitting there in his office and, and Frank comes in uh, and he asked this question to David. When do we get to the good stuff? When do we get to the good stuff? And, and, and David, it, it says, I've been in this situation. Perhaps you've been in this situation. You know, we, we talk about being the church of the first century, being the church that we read of in the Bible, all these types of things. And, and, and David's mind, like my mind sometimes goes to when I have a question like this, David's mind, when, when Frank said, when do we get to the good stuff? David's mind automatically went to, oh no. You know, we, we've told him that we want to be like the church of the Bible. We've told him that we want to do things like the church in the Bible. We've told him we want to live like this and act like this and obey like this to be this church. And, and here and now he's reading about miracles. He's reading about speaking in tongues. He's reading about all of these types of things. He's reading about the apostles being there and, and those who had been with Jesus and, and all of these things. And, and now, even though I, it's, it's right and it's good, I've got to explain to him somehow that, yeah, we want to be like that church of the first century, but... We don't have miracles today. And that's true and it's right. And we know the scripture teaches that, that miracles uh, died out with the, with the apostles and with the apostolic age as the apostles were able to, as you continue to read on in Acts and study this, not, not the topic, topic for today's devotional, but uh, of course uh, the apostles had been given the power of the Holy Spirit miraculously. All of us received the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38, but the apostles had it in a miraculous sense, a miraculous level, and they were able to, to give miraculous abilities to other people, but then those other people, they, they couldn't pass on those miraculous abilities. Only the apostles could do that. Miracles were meant for a certain time and a certain place to establish the Word of God, but now that we have the entire, entire complete Word of God in the Bible, we, we don't need miracles today in the same sense. Uh, but still, you can understand. Perhaps you can look to your, your early on in your own faith or, or perhaps even now in your own faith and say, man, what would it be like to have miracles today? Man, I, we want to be like the church of the first century, but they had miracles and we don't have miracles. And, and you can see the, uh, the, the contention, the, the stress that, that's going on there. And that's what David believed was going on in, in um, 
Frank's mind. And he, he says in the book that he doesn't remember exactly what he says, but something along the lines of, uh, you know, teaching and, and showing in Scripture that uh, those miraculous abilities uh, went away with the uh, apostolic age, that as the apostles uh, and those who they passed on that miraculous ability uh, faded away and passed away, then so as well did that uh, opportunity to uh, per provide and, and perform miracles. And I want to read to you what, uh, what he says Frank's response was. Listen to this. He says, whatever I said, I'll never forget his disappointed, Frank's disappointed response. He said, I'm not talking about the apostles, he clarified. I'm asking for the kind of devotion I see in this book. I'm asking about awe. I'm asking about people so passionate about a movement that they would sell all that they have to be a part of it. I'm wondering why we don't have baptisms anymore, or why we don't talk about God doing big things in our church. I'm not asking for the apostles. I'm asking for a church filled with passion, with power, and with boldness. I'm asking why we aren't a church that wants to change the world like the Acts chapter 2 church did. I'm asking why we when are we going to start doing that? Brothers and sisters, is that does that step on your toes a little bit? Uh, does that show you what an appreciation this, this young Christian and his faith uh, had for what the, the Bible, the first century church was really like? The passion, the energy, the devotion, the, the willingness to, to sacrifice for this movement that they believed in so that the world could change? What is it later on when, when Peter and John, a believer, are preaching and someone says, these men have turned the world upside down. It wasn't just those men. It wasn't just the apostles. It was the disciples. It was all Christians who were living in such a way with such passion and with such fervor and with such zeal that they lived differently. I'm afraid today that the church... And when I say the church, I don't necessarily mean the entire body of Christ as, and worldwide. I don't even necessarily mean the entire body of Christ at your local congregation or the congregation here at Charlotte Avenue. What, what I mean is the church as in every individual Christian, including myself in some ways, I'm afraid that we've become too much like the world. I'm af afraid that sometimes we're, we're too ritualistic, that we, were, we, we depend too much on Sunday too much on Wednesday, too much on times when we are inside this building. We've become too building-centered. You know, if anything, over these last several months, as we have not been able to, to meet together and worship, hopefully we have learned and can appreciate the fact that, that we, we benefit tremendously from gathering together. We're commanded to gather together, to assemble, to be the church collectively on, on Sunday, to, to come together to worship. We, we're commanded to do that. But hopefully we've also been able to see, because we haven't been able to do that, how we can still be and still are the church, not just on Sundays, not just in big groups, not just at worship assemblies, not just at Bible classes or youth rallies or gospel meetings, but we are the church every single day. And we, if the world is going to change, if we're going to get to the good stuff like Frank is talking about, it's not going to happen just on Sundays or if we're too ritualistic, thinking about Sundays being the most important day, or if we're too much like the world, or if we're too building-centered, it's only going to happen, and it will happen if we will recognize that today I have the chance, I have the duty, I have the obligation, and I have the privilege to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So again, let me read this to you, and I simply want to leave this with you. I want you to do some introspection. I want you to do some meditation upon what God's word says, Acts 2, 42 through 47, and what this young brother's response was, you know, some uh, almost 30, 40 years ago now, right? Whenever, whatever I said, I'll never forget his disappointed response. I'm not asking for the apostles, he clarified. I'm asking for the kind of devotion I see in this book, the book of Acts. I'm asking about awe. I'm asking about people so passionate about a movement that they would sell all that they have to be a part of it. I'm wondering why we don't have baptisms anymore or why do we, we don't talk about God doing big things in our church. I'm not asking for apostles. I'm asking for a church filled with passion and pe with power and with boldness. I'm asking why we aren't a church that wants to change the world. Why are we not a church who wants to change the world like the Acts chapter 2 church did? I'm asking 
When are we going to start doing that?